you can be seated. I was going to talk to this morning. Thank everyone for being here. If you see or know of anyone that's not here, please notify them this week and let them know you missed them. But they said by you or whatever. But during this Christmas time, you know, sometimes feel, people feel a little lonely and things. So uh, let's just remember those not here. Here we keep Melvin and the Barb in your prayers this week. Melvin had it. Military service this past Monday. Randy said it went real well for him, honoring him for his military service. So we're thankful for that. And remember to keep Barb also in your prayers as she's his caregiver and his rock at this time to so give her strength. Remember to keep Sarita in prayer. She's going to have surgery this week on Tuesday. We pray for a quick recovery and thank you go well there. She'll be able to get up and around soon. Also remember to keep Andy, Andy's brother, William finding cancer in the prairie. And ones that are traveling this Christmas season, we've seen how bad it was for the ones traveling over Thanksgiving with the weather and thing. So let's just remember our families and those that are out on the highways and traveling. Let's also remember to, you know, let's pray for revival for our, first of all, for our community, our state, our country. You know, we definitely need revival. Let's go Lord. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the sunshine. We thank you for the beautiful season you've given us. We thank you for your son, Jesus, for coming into our world that we might be saved. We thank you for the ones that's here. We pray for the ones that's mentioned on our prayer list, and the ones that's written in our bulletin. Fathers, be with them. And the ones that weren't mentioned today that on our hearts and minds, comfort them this day and give them peace in their hearts and minds. Father, we thank you for loving us. Sending your son Jesus on our behalf. And we thank you for this day. Just be with our service. May we bring glory and honor to you through our worship and praise. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
It's going to be hard to do. Use another hand. Sonia would like to talk a little bit about the Christmas story, not the movie, not a Christmas story. I'm not talking about Ralphie and the BB gun, Red Ryder BB gun. Which, put your yeah, put your eye out. Put your eye out. I'd like to read this morning from uh, Luke, second chapter, beginning with verse 8. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone, shone around them. And they were terrified that the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Today in this town, today in the town of David, I say it right, today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. <clears throat> Suddenly, a great company of, of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth. Peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see, see this thing that has happened which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. That's not, that's the beginning maybe of the story, but that is not the whole story of, of who Jesus is. We celebrate Christmas, uh, Jesus' birth this time of year, but that's, let's not forget what Jesus, what his purpose on this earth was. He came to be born as, as a man to, uh, to uh, experience the things we experience, but he lived a sinless life because he was the perfect sacrifice, the perfect son of God, perfect lamb for, for the sacrifice. And he was born to save the world. In John 3, 16, we all, we're all familiar with, these, with this passage. For God so loved the world that he gave his only, one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. And that's not even the, 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 the whole story. As we go over to Romans uh, chapter 10, verse 9, 9 and 10, he had the power over death, and he was, he was crucified for our sins, he was sacrificed for our sins, nailed on the cross for our sins. He died and was buried, but he rose again by the power of God. In Romans, if I find it. Okay. 9 and 10. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. That's why we, we remember uh, the, the blood and the, the body today as we, we take communion. The, the cup is representing the blood of Christ that was poured out for our sins. The bread represents his body that was crucified and, and marred and tortured for, for our healing. So as, as we think about those things this morning, just ponder in your heart what this season really is about. It's not about presence. It's not about uh, getting together with family. All those, thing, all those things are good. And we observe those and we, we, we enjoy those. But the season that we're celebrating now is the birth of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we come to you this morning in this time of communion, remembering the sacrifice that you made, remembering the death you suffered for our, our sins, the blood you poured out for, to cover our sins. Lord, we bless this bread this morning. It is your body. It represents your body. Lord, we bless it and we receive it. Jesus' name, and the cup that represent, represents your blood that was poured out freely for the forgiveness of our sins, the covering of our sins, Lord, bless it in the name of Jesus also. Father, just continue with, with us as we worship you. We give you all praise and glory in Jesus' name.
in heaven. We thank you for the many blessings that you have given us. Father, we pray that as we take this offering today, that you will bless this offering. That you will do with it as you have done before with the fish. That you will double this offering. We pray, Father, that you will use this offering to bless others. To bless the homeless. To bless the, the needy. For anything, Father, that you need us to do. We thank you, Father, for the giving hearts of those who give. We thank you, Father, for this church and for the body here. In your name we pray.
Try and turn it on the overhead. Oh, okay. You gotta try to catch on to that theme. I like to have the lights on so you're awake and ready to stay and work out. Uh, make sure you're grabbing after Bible. We're going to be in the book of Philippians today. We'll be looking at the second chapter. It's my favorite Christmas story passage in Philippians chapter 2. But before we do that, let's pray and give honor and glory to God. Father God Almighty, the one who has spoke of creation to existence, uh, the Father that has loved us and died of us and has uh, paid the price for our sins. Thank you, Jesus, for what you've done for us. Uh, life that you have given for the opportunity to spend eternity forever with you, with God, with the Holy Spirit, and to uh, be in that union. <coughs> Thank you again for these men and women. I pray for clarity in uh, this time of teaching. I pray that you, Holy Spirit, would lead, guide, and uh, Lord, that you would work on our hearts and our minds to teach us and direct us in the path we should go. It's in your almighty name, Jesus Christ, that we ask and pray these things. Amen. Amen. Anybody in this room have troubles falling asleep at night? Anyone? Yeah. All right, so a fourth of you maybe, a third? I would say everybody in this room at some point or another has had troubles falling asleep at night. I do every once in a while. Uh, I, you know, I can't stand up here and say it's very often. Joe Bandy can tell you that's not the truth. I usually fall asleep like that. Uh, it's quite a blessing. However, when I have troubles falling asleep, I'll give you a little clue how to help yourself to fall asleep. Last night, I, it wasn't too bad, but uh, you know, I was awake a little bit, and, and this is a practice I try to do. I'm easily fascinated. It doesn't take much. I stood up here before, before you, and I'm fascinated. I can hold my hand up in the air and, and command my finger to bend. You know, I just find that totally fascinating. Uh, last night, as I was laying in bed, I, it was the thought of being able to fall asleep. You ever stop and think about that? The whole sleep process? I mean, isn't it amazing? I know scientifically they can tell us all this stuff about how we fall asleep and what happened in the process of being asleep, but you fall asleep each night, or however often it is for you, and then somehow your body tells you to wake up, your batteries are recharged, you, you've got renewed energy through the sleep process. Does anybody else find that absolutely miraculous and amazing? I mean, how is that possible? You know, these are the kind of things that we need to honor and worship God with. And when you're trying to fall asleep and maybe you're having troubles falling asleep, worship God. What better time? What better opportunity? We've been in this series called The Three Trees. The idea of the series is that in the beginning, in, in the Garden of Eden, God created everything that was there. We know this, we know factually from things in, in, in nature, in history, all these things that are factual to the truth of God and to Christianity. But in the Garden of Eden, there was two trees created, the knowledge of, well, multiple, thousands, hundreds of thousands of trees, but two ones that were listed specifically of importance, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which by the way was probably not a, a pine tree. I just put that up there for the holiday season. Uh, <laughs> The reason I can say that with pretty a lot of confidence is it says that the fruit upon that tree was delightful to the eye to eat. Uh, I don't remember any on a pine tree. But anyway, <laughs> there was a tree of the knowledge of the good and evil, and then there was the tree of life. And, and the, the, the assumption or an inference we can make with the scriptures and the reading of the word of God is that that tree of life is what was pr making provision for a very, very eternal life. And you know, so often we hear phrases like, uh, was there children in the Garden of Eden? Well, an assumption I can make about that is when they committed the sin and they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that God had told them not to eat from, it said that Eve would now, or that women would now experience pain in childbirth. Well, how would they know any difference? Well, my thought, or our thought probably to that, is that she'd already had children there in the Garden of Eden. There may have been hundreds of children. Who knows? We don't know how long a period they spent in the Garden of Eden. But the point being of the three trees. They ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then in the book of Revelations, we have a description of what it will be in heaven. And that the tree of life is in heaven, eternal. That we will have life eternal with God. However, there's a separation for us because of the sins that every one of you in this room and myself have committed. 
and that sin takes us away from that tree of life and the tree in the middle, which is described as the tree that Jesus was hung on, uh, says in the scripture that a man that is hung upon a tree is cursed. Jesus took the curse of our sin, of our debt on himself to give us eternal life. Now the reason I describe all this to you is because this is just two more Sundays before Christmas. Does everybody realize that? Yeah. December 8th. Anybody else like, I can't believe it's already December 8th? We've been going through the study. The main premise of this, and as we're going to look at this morning, I'm going to jump ahead one slide. The main premise is that, why do we celebrate Christmas? In the church, why do we celebrate Christmas? Yeah, because of Christ. Because he is a real man, and he was completely God, and he lived a sin-free life here on this earth, and he took upon himself the dead. You know, for any one of us in this room, if you're asked a question, and I heard this question earlier this morning, Mr. Dennis back there was talking about it, but if you're asked a question, where will you spend eternity? And you know, the, the, probably the mass majority of people that you ask that question to are going to say heaven, whether they believe in Jesus or not. And then, then in the next question you ask them, well, why do you believe that? Why do you think you'll spend eternity in heaven? If the next answer is not because of Jesus Christ, it's the incorrect answer. Do you catch it? Amen. That's the most essential detail for every single one of us sitting in this house at this very moment. If you attend church, if you go to church anywhere, if you have claims of Christ, if you have the relationship with God, then if you do not answer the question, where will you spend eternity in heaven, and why would you spend eternity there, if your answer is not Jesus Christ, that's not right. There's something wrong. And that's why we're on this whole description of the truth of God's Word, the importance of it. Again, a lot of you have seen this picture. I've been putting it up every single week. This idea, this bus that we drive in life. Every single one of us are driving our own bus. We have all these different things pulling at us, influencing us, giving us ideas. And uh, the ones listed up here are truth. Uh, that being God's Word, the absolute truth. Uh, family. Any of, you, any of you have overbearing families? Maybe grown up with that or parents that maybe you're a grown adult and your your uh, parents are still uh, trying to direct your path. Feelings, uh, you know, our emotions, uh, work, you know, that tends to be a driving force in our lives a lot of times. Friends and experiences. And the bottom line is, if truth is not driving our bus, if truth gets moved back to the second row or the third row, then everything else is at stake. And that's such an important detail for all of us to remember in this room. That's why when I ask the question, why do you think you would go to heaven? And the statement is, if you don't say Jesus Christ, or because of what Jesus did on the cross, or because you have surrendered your life to Jesus Christ and what he did for you on that cross, I can tell you point blank, it's incorrect. And my friends, it doesn't matter if we think it's politically correct or not, God is correct. He's the one who created this earth, this universe, and he's the one who sent his son, Jesus Christ, to redeem this earth. Scripture clearly states he is the only way. This world will try to persuade you that there's many different paths and many different ways, and that's absolutely not correct. So with that thought in mind, I want to show you a little video clip that reminds us about this whole idea of Christmas, what we're doing at this time of the year so Follow along. Follow the words on the screen. Get you ready? Everybody focused? All right, here we go.
would say a lot of you in this room get very stressed during the Christmas season with everything and all the activities and all the planning and all the things that take part of that. Does, does anybody get stressed with all that stuff? Yeah. I was just talking with someone earlier this morning that it seems like we should take all the good stuff packed into December and spread it out a bit through the year and spread the love throughout the year instead of trying to pack it into three weeks worth of time. Um, if you didn't see it all on the screen, I want to run down through real quick the words there. Uh, it, it basically said we are here to slow down amidst all the shopping, gift wrapping, cleaning, bickering, and stress. Amen? Amen. So good to see you here in this house. That's why we try to make it such a strong priority. It should be one of our top priorities to try to be here on a Sunday morning because life pulls at us in all kinds of different directions and we need to be focused. You know, I'm always, uh, we pray on Saturday, my, my family, we always pray on Saturday for the Lord to put it on our hearts today and to bring us here and to be here present and, and to thank God for this day that we have opportunity to be with all of you. You know, that we're here together with other people that believe in Jesus Christ and we have opportunity to worship together. We are here to remind ourselves Christmas is more than just gifts, family tradition, decorating, and Santa. You know, those are fun things. And I'm sure a lot of you have probably been in that gift buying bit and doing all those things, but there's something more. Goes on to say, maybe, if it wants to respond, here we go. No, it decided it doesn't want to respond. He'll come back up. Any of you else have updates on your computers that sometimes drive you absolutely crazy? Constantly. Yeah, so. Matter of fact, it took me like three or four shots to even get this together for you this morning. Hmm. Give me one moment, I'll be right with you. <laughs> All right, we are not here just to be uh, just to see and be seen. Sing our favorite carol, sit with friends and family, and listen to a special sermon. Does that sound like anything that we're doing right now? We've been singing carols. Hopefully sit with family and friends and uh, listen to a very special sermon. Rather, we are here to remember the night when God left the throne on high, when the balance of the world hung upon a helpless baby, when the journey to the cross began with a shrill cry. Now we're going to read that passage in just a moment from Philippians chapter 2. But when you stop and think about that, Jesus was God in the beginning and with God and what it describes to us in the Gospel of John of that nature. Can you fathom God giving all that up to be a baby, to take on that innocence of that nature? It's just extremely fascinating to me. We are here to worship the child we now call Emmanuel, which, which means God with us. Redeemer uh, means to be paid the price. Savior uh, means you can't do it yourself. And friend, we are here because this child changed everything through the way to salvation offered his life for ours. We are here because Christmas means God loves us. He is with us. There is hope for everyone. That's an important one to remember, isn't it? There's hope for everyone. We are here because the great gift that Jesus was given to all and for all. That's why we celebrate. That's why we sing. That's why we are here. This morning, as we talk about why Christmas, I want every single one of you in this room to be doing a mental check with yourself, your own life, and looking at what is it that you're celebrating with Christmas. And if someone is looking at you, one of your children is looking at you as a mom or a dad, or your parents are looking at you as a child, what are they going to see in your observance of this holiday? With the way that you're acting, the way that you're spending money, the things that you're doing, glorify Jesus Christ. Or are you really glorifying something else? Do a check of that in your own life and, and what you're really celebrating this time. Philippians chapter 2. I say this is my favorite Christmas passage uh, because of the content of it. Dennis was just talking about it during his communion meditation up here. Starts off and says, If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete. Do you hear that when you, when you read through it? Think about if I'm asking you that question personally it, to you in this room. 
if you have any encouragement from being a Christian man or woman, if you have any comfort from the love of Jesus Christ, if you have any fellowship with the Holy Spirit and the gift that is the guarantee the Father put into you, if you have any tenderness and compassion because what takes place in this house as you worship Jesus Christ, then what are we to do? Make my joy complete. And whose joy are we talking about? Well, we're talking about God's, but we're also talking about Paul as he writes this passage to the Christian church and to the believers to make their joy complete. And this is how it happened. So do any of you have any of those things listed on the screen? Do you have any of that? Tenderness, compassion, encouragement, going to church, being in relationship to Jesus. Do you have any of these things? Then make the joy complete, and this is how it says. By being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do you realize that you, sitting in this house, you're part of the largest family in the entire world? You can go any place in this world at this very moment and have a brother or sister because of Jesus Christ. No matter what our background, no matter how much money or lack of money, how much we've uh, been raised, what our thoughts are, what our worldviews are, what our, our, uh, our political party is, any of it, none of it matters. We are united by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's what brings us together. It says, make my joy complete by being like-minded. Well, how in the world can we take a room full of us motley people and be like-minded. God's Word. Truth. Why do you think it's so important that truth drives the bus? Uh, having the same love. Well, how can you guys and, and, and me to you have the same love? Well, Jesus Christ. You know, when we go to Africa, it's like we're home. And we're, wherever I go in the world, when you walk into the church, you should be home. Being one in spirit and purpose. And what's our purpose in this room? Alright, to glorify God. And what's our job? To tell others, to spread the seed, to make disciples of all men and women. Goes on to say, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. This is our approach to what we've been told to do. But in humility, consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. How's that happen practically in a room like this? Well, we're all. We look to each other in this room. I don't look down on anybody. Well, at the moment I am because I'm up <laughs> on the stage. But none of us look down on each other. It doesn't matter how we walk into this room today. We're on equal ground at the cross. We love Jesus Christ. And so with that thought and that mind and heart, we humble ourselves in, in service to each other. That's what a perfect family looks like. That's why so often I hear people say, this family means a whole lot more to me than my biological family. Well, that's because this family is being driven by the truth of Jesus Christ and his word yes. and not necessarily the things sometimes our biological families are driven by. He goes on, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Now, let's think about that for a moment. The same as that of Christ Jesus. <clears throat> the perfect man. God. Here on earth. How can our attitude be the same as, uh, of, of his? You know, I was just sitting here thinking as, as Beth was praying up here. Uh, and she was, as she started off, you know, I was just thinking about the Lord's Prayer. And how the Lord's Prayer, you know, talks about glorifying God. And it says, let your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Yeah. Well, what's that mean? What's God's will in heaven? <clears throat> There's no sin in heaven. Perfect love. That should be the things that drive us here on this earth. Goes on in verse 6. Who being in the very nature of God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. But made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. Alright, so, how many of you have ever been put in a humbling situation? Anyone? Probably everybody in this room? 
You know, we should never, what says you go into a party, where should you go sit? You go over to somebody's home, where should you, what seat should you take? Well, the one closest to the table, right? <laughs> you know, I said, and you guys see this all the time, and maybe you've been guilty of this yourself. But so often we see people come in and they assume that they get the seat of honor. Or they go to the main place, or they get the best seats, or they rush to the front. Well, what's it saying in the scriptures about that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it basically says, uh, don't be too quick. Humble yourself, because you may rush to the front, you may take that seat of honor, and the host may come along and go, uh, excuse me, you're in the wrong seat. You need to get up and move to the end of the line, for our guest of honor is here. What? I'm not the guest of honor? <laughs> you know, it tells us in this word that Jesus is the honor above all honor. And yet having that status, being the God of all creation, he humbled himself uh, to be made in human likeness. And so we see the picture of the manger, the humblest of circumstances. He took it all upon himself and was born here on this earth in the most humble of situation to show the love of God. And just a quick reminder to every one of you in this room, if you want to know what God's like, you know, we always have this picture of God, you know, he's so big and I get that. And, and if you can put God in a little box and you can get your mind wrapped around that your God is way too small this morning because I am fascinated by a God that can speak into creation and universe that is so massive that we can't even experience the links of it. And yet, God and all that became a man. So if you want to know what God is like, look at the life of Jesus Christ. Just study, read the Bible, and you will see the character of God and his love and his grace and his mercy. It goes on to say, he was made into human likeness and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Cross. We've been going through this on Wednesdays, this study about Jesus and approaching the cross, how he was completely man, completely deity, and complete in death. But do you know that it says in the scriptures that when he was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, we talked about this a few weeks ago even in here. He said that he could call how many legions of angels did he tell Peter? It's a much smaller number. I mean, as far as legions. He says 12 legion of angels. Let's do a little uh, trivia here. How much was a legion back in Roman times? There was 6,000 in a legion. 6,000 times 12 is how much? 72,000. So, when Peter draws his sword and tries to defend Jesus Christ, and Jesus tells him to put away the sword, for I can call down 12 legions of angels right now, what is he saying? Yes. I guess yeah. You know, if, uh, if, I, if, if, I, if the crowd turned here this morning, and he's all coming at me, and I say, hey, listen, I can bring in 72,000 <laughs> warriors right now, against you 80 people, would that put the fear of God into you? Yeah. Yeah, you probably wouldn't believe it if I said it. But that's what Jesus said. <laughs> so what is he saying to us? I don't have to do this. And they can't force me to do this. I submit myself <coughs> willingly to this. And then one last part of that, we just looked at this last Wednesday night. Uh, it says on the cross that Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You guys familiar with that? Yeah. Do you know what Jesus is saying there? I mean, Jesus is saying, oh my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You know, and, and, and woe to God and questioning God. That's hogwash. That's not what he's saying. He's quoting scripture. You know that, right? Do you know that, right? He's quoting what? What, what scripture? Psalm 22, 
And if you read Psalm 22, it describes exactly how Jesus is going to be crucified on the cross. And it says that all men will hear of God and that God will be victorious. That's what Psalm 22 <clears throat> teaches. So what is Jesus saying on the cross? Even at that point, he's saying, I'm God. And this is part of the plan. And I willingly submit and surrender myself upon the cross for you. And that's what you got to hear. The for you. All the power in creation in the universe was at his beckoning call. And he chose to humble himself and die upon a cross. And let me take that a step further into us in this house. And yet... We, as his followers and believers, we, the ones who surrender our lives and follow after him, will hold on to grudges and debts. We will put up barriers between us and other people for whatever reasons. And yet God, seeing all that we are, died on the cross for my sin. Can you fathom it? We are called to take on the same attitude of Christ Jesus. It goes on, verse 9, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name that at the name of Jesus was getting ready to happen. Listen to it. Every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Do you hear what that's telling us? Remember the question I asked. Where are you going to spend eternity? Most people are going to say heaven. Why do you believe that? What's the correct answer? Jesus. Because of Jesus Christ. Salvation is in him alone. Here in these verses, it tells us that at the end of time, and I'll say this to every one of you in this room, whether you Surrender your life to Jesus Christ or not? Whether you believe a word I'm saying up here in the pulpit or not? When you come to that final moment of life, you will bow before Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior. There is no other. The scriptures teach that every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. The question boils down to, and why are we celebrating Christmas? The question boils down to, do we now willingly and voluntarily surrender and kneel before our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? That's what it all comes to. Have we confessed that Jesus Christ is Lord? And I want to highlight before we move on real quick, right before, before verse 11. We read, it says, in heaven and on earth, and you guys want to finish the rest? And under the earth. What is that talking about? Hell. Yeah, you know, the, uh, now is hell at the center of the earth? I doubt it. However, fine with me if it is. However, not getting into that one today. <laughs> what I am getting into is this. The description of the writer in this in, in, in uh, Philippians is describing that idea of hell. And it's saying that even the demons of the depths of hell will bow to Jesus Christ as Lord. Everything, everything will bow to Jesus Christ. No, it's been intense. But why do we celebrate Christmas? Because of Jesus. He is Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ Almighty. With that picture in mind, we have the cross of Jesus. It should always be the picture of a barren cross because Jesus Christ has risen victorious over death. If that would not be the case, then we have a lot of uh, uh, wasted time on our hands. The last picture I want to show you is that of the manger to the cross and that idea that it is all for love. 
I want to leave you with this thought as we wrap up here this morning. As you do your celebration of Christmas, <clears throat> gifts, serving, helping community, reaching out to people, keep in mind this thought. How can I show love to my neighbor? How can I show love to my coworker? How can I show love to my family member and maybe even that family member that's kind of distant from the family? Uh, how can I show love? And you got to know the last one I'm going to say. How can I show love to my to my enemies? Enemies. Yeah. What? Mm -hmm. That's what Scripture says. To show love to your enemies. You know, this is called a time of peace. How do we show that sacrificial love to a community desperately in need of Jesus Christ? To show them the light of who Jesus Christ is. It takes sacrifice. So tonight, when you're having trouble falling asleep, praise and glorify Jesus Christ for what he has done for our celebration of Christmas. And then ask the simple question, Lord Jesus, how can I sacrifice myself in a way that will show your love during this Christmas time of year? Would you bow your heads and pray with me? Father, as we uh, worship, as we have looked at your word, as we study the truth of who you are, Jesus, we know that you tell us to have the same attitude that you have, and uh, that's a difficult thing for us a lot of times. So we pray for you to change us, transform us, to renew us, to put a hunger in us for the truth of the word, that we would be serious and honest about studying that word and allow that word to transform us, that we would humble ourselves and become obedient, worshiping you, serving you, till our final breath, giving glory and honor to you, Jesus Christ. Lord, we're amazed by you. You're so worthy of all the praise. It's in your almighty name, Jesus Christ, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Would you please stand as the praise team leads us in a time of invitation. Again, if you have not confessed Jesus Christ, if you have not yielded to him voluntarily, I'm encouraging you, imploring you, begging you to make that decision for Jesus this day. doesn't matter your age. doesn't matter how you ended up here this morning. If you haven't done that, then you need to make that step today.
pizza, not pizza, pajama party tonight. <laughs> that probably had pizza here. Uh, for our youth group, um, we're going to have a Christmas movie and bring a snack share with Trim. That's from 5 to 7 tonight. Our soup kitchen is this week. Uh, we don't have a sign up sheet out there, but we're using some of the ham we had left over, I think, from our fellowship. So if anybody can bring some beans or cornbread and have them here at the church tomorrow, um, that's what we need to finish out that soup kitchen list. Christmas is the, in the park is coming up this Friday and Saturday evening. Uh, it's going to be set up Thursday afternoon. Uh, I think any extra hands would be appreciated there. And also right after church today, men or men and women, if you could stay and help, we've got to get some stuff out of the storage shed out back here, just get it brought in. Uh, so it could be worked on a little bit this week before we set up. So we just need a little help right after church to do that. Socks and Sweets donations, the box is still out there. We're still looking for uh, items there in your bulletin or see Mike Mor uh, Morgan about that. Children's Play is December 29th. And I think that's it. Hey, a couple of other quick reminders. If there, when you hear the truth of God's word and sometimes you feel conviction uh, in a sermon or in praise or whatever during the church service, we have counselors that want to pray with you. I know Dennis was seeing up here. He took his tag off already. But after service, if you want to pray with somebody or talk to somebody, they're willing to that. They, they want to help and, uh, and direct. And, um, you know, some of the things that have, have come up in the past, just a quick example is, you know, uh, of people that have had a disconnected relationship, maybe with a family member or something of that nature where We've had people actually reach out and extend to those family members and restore relationships. Those are difficult things. And I know there's a lot of baggage in that sometimes, but it helps to be able to pray with somebody and to talk to somebody. So I want to encourage you in that. One other thing that wasn't on our list is uh, this coming Saturday is the Christmas baskets. A lot of you are probably familiar with that. We fill these boxes full of food. We pass them out to people all over uh, Mount Vernon. There's going to be over 500 of those uh, delivered. Uh, anybody know how long it takes to deliver 500 baskets of food? We need as many drivers as possible. 8.30 a.m. Saturday morning at the Roland Lewis building there at the city park. We'll deliver those baskets. Uh, if we have lots of people, it means that you're only taking out four or five. Uh, you know, last year I was going clear till the end till they closed up shop and I was still gone because there were so many and we had a bunch that didn't get delivered out. So we need uh, lots of people to drive and to help out. So if any of you can help out with that, 8.30 Saturday morning, Roland Lewis building at the City Park. All right? Also, harvest charge, I forgot to mention that. If you still have any home, we need those in here because we need to total that up and be able to give out those benevolence gifts. Really, we'd like to have those in there by Monday or Tuesday. You can stop by the church and drop those off. Let's pray. Father, we want to uh, close with giving praise and glory to you alone. Your word tells us that if you be lifted up, Jesus Christ, that men will be drawn to you. So we want to do that in our lives, in the way we respond to people, in the way that we live out our lives. Help us, Lord Jesus, to do that well. Uh, and Lord, we want to say Merry Christmas. Thank you for making it possible. It's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen.